Welcome everyone to Monster Vision, your off-season source for hockey news and information in Central California. I'm John English, and uh, of course, first off, I want to thank everyone who has been tuning into Monster Vision. Um, every episode is is growing, and uh, we uh, we cannot do what we do without you. So, of course, we want to suggest that uh, if you're following us on social media, keep doing that. Like our posts, share them, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, you know tell a friend, all of those great uh, things help us to continue doing what we're doing. Uh, we've got a lot for you coming up uh, today on the program, including a visit with the Monsters Roundtable. But first and foremost, I want to welcome our guest this week. Uh, welcome to the show, the Director of Hockey for the Fresno Junior Hockey Club and Fresno Falcons legend, Jeff Ferguson. Jeff, how are you doing? I'm good, John. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, first off, you know, crazy times we're living in. How are you? How is everyone around you? Everybody safe, healthy? So far, so good. Um, I'm lucky. I'm still able to still able to work, and and uh, I don't have to. Like I say, a lot of folks have been laid off and what have you. So I'm I'm lucky that way. Fortunate, everyone's safe. I feel bad for the kids though. They're probably driving their parents crazy and going nuts themselves. But other than that, everything's okay. Right. Very good to hear it. Um, of course, you've got a lot of history here in Fresno, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, but let's talk about the present. Uh, you have been instrumental in heading up youth hockey in the Fresno area. Uh, talk a little bit about what you've been doing recently. Well, I mean, obviously things have changed. It's been tough. But I think, you know, the, the junior hockey club took, took over the youth hockey back last year, back in September, officially. Um, and when I stopped playing, I was involved a lot. So I was involved for about three or four years, maybe five years when I first retired from hockey. Then took a break and then came back again. Uh, a friend of mine, Bill Ferguson, uh, the, got me back into coaching about three years ago. And then, you know, when it turned out that the, the club was going to take over the youth hockey program again, um, you know, they needed someone kind of to head it up and, and start uh, trying to promote hockey in the area. And really, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a harder sell I mean, we had a, we were fortunate to have the Falcons here for years and a little easier to get um, some attention or some excitement about hockey when you have, you know, four or five, 6,000 people down at Sol Arena. So it made it a little bit easier back then. A little tougher now, you know, with, with the, I mean, it's great when we were down at, when the Monsters were down at Selland, we were able to promote it and get some people out, out to the rink. But uh, really, it's just trying to get, get the kids involved. Um, we have a really good group of hockey players and it actually, this past season that's grown our, our our developmental league or our our learn to play program it's a free a free program which is actually awesome you just go on the website um and your first four weeks are, are free uh learn to play hockey so it's, it's actually a really good program that is great what in your opinion is is the kind of the state of of youth hockey and in, in california and here locally and, and and you know are there any changes that you'd like to see come into play in the you know whenever we get playing again here uh what what do you think how how are things looking right now overall well I th like in fresno you know we actually we're growing this year we're going to have probably two more travel teams this year uh we have a real nice group of eight and under kids skating again which is awesome uh i mean the big problem as always is just the cost of playing the sport you know it's not like you can just get a ball and go and cross the road into the field and kick it around um so there's the expense i mean if there's a way i mean ideally um you know, some major sponsorship would be great to help uh, help these kids with travel expenses, equipment, and ice time rentals, things like that. Um, youth hockey in California, you know, I, I'm not sure if it seems like I know down in Southern California, you know, they're building rinks, new facilities. Uh, Northern California, I think we're, you know, probably a little behind right now. Uh, San Jose is putting another two sheets of ice in their, in their building. So they're going to have a rink there with, I think, five, five sheets of ice or six sheets of ice. So it's pretty amazing in San Jose. But I mean, it's just, it's tough. It's not on the top of everyone's mind. Again, we have some, some great athletes playing now. It's just a matter of uh, getting more kids out there. Right. Now, we're just two years removed from a team that you helped coach uh, winning the CAHA B Division state finals. And then just a year later, uh, you know, getting to compete in the uh, Silver Sticks tournament up in uh, Toronto. Um, with that success, you know, coming out of Fresno, I feel like, you know, growing up here, Fresno has always been underestimated uh, and, 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 you know, kind of always the underdog in, in anything. What do you think is the biggest misconception about, about hockey in Fresno and, and, and the youth program there? 
you know, I, I don't know what it is. I think we've always, it seems like we've always been competitive though at the youth. I mean, we've had, I mean, even when I was playing here, um, I think we had state championship teams then at the youth level. I mean, we had kids at that time drafted in the AHL, played in the AHL that are out of Fresno. And I'm not sure how many people really know that. So um, I'm not sure what it is, but we've always been pretty successful. And it, it's always, you know, it's a little disheartening because we, we do develop some good players, but they always feel a sense to leave. They have to go to San Jose or what have you. And, and I, I get it, but I think, you know, if we, if we can find a way to keep some of these kids here and develop our teams at the higher level or at the, at the, at the older levels, older ages, we could have some really good teams come out of here. And again, like I say, you know, gosh, 20, 25 years ago, uh, you look at the Tarker brothers, uh, the Oliver brothers. I mean, these guys, you know, uh, I think Marky played with Colorado just a few, a few years back. And that's a kid that played youth hockey in Fresno. Uh, you know, uh, the Tarkers were drafted, Division One scholarships. So, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunity here for these kids. It's just a matter of, uh, of getting a little more excitement about it. Now, as you start your second year in the current role here uh, coming up, what lessons did you learn um, in your first year doing what you're doing now, and, and, and what surprised you, uh, both, both good and bad, about, uh, about your current work? Well, I, I th you know, we kind of, um, a lot of it was a learning, learning experience, especially the first year. I mean, we were thrown into this thing in September. Our tryouts were you know, in August, and then we were off and running September. So it was more, I think, more of just dealing with the different personalities. And things have changed since I was involved this heavily. Um, and obviously, change, things have changed since when I was a youth hockey player. Uh, when I was youth, a youth hockey player, there really wasn't much arguing, or not arguing, but, you know, what the coach said is the way, the way things work, and that's the way you did things. There was no uh, real discussion about it. it. Seems a little different now, different personalities, and kids are different, obviously. Uh, they're, uh, I don't know if they're smarter or what it is, but they, they certainly have opinions about how things should be done and how, how, you know, practice should be ran or if they should be playing at this position or that position or playing time. So it is a little different. Um, and I think it's more, I can say it's not quite as hard line as it used to be. I mean, even kids in junior hockey now, even the pro levels, it's more of a kind of a softer relationship between coaches and players and what have you. It's not quite as hard nosed as it used to be. So getting used to that is is at times tough and a challenge for me. Uh, I'm not as fiery as I used to be, thank, thankfully. So uh, it's, it's been an experience. And dealing even with personalities of parents and coaches and different things like that. But I think we have a, a better handle on it now um, as far as the direction we're going. And you know, we were really, things were getting ramped up and, the, and the, we have a great board and, and we're excited about getting things going and then this happened. So you know, we had a team, we had a team that would have went to state championships this year at the, at the uh, at the squirt level, they finished second in their division. They certainly would have been top two in NorCal. And then we had our high school team that was in the playoffs as well. And that, you know, that got set aside. So too bad for the kids. They were excited. But I think the weekend, the weekend that we, uh, that the state actually closed down was the weekend of our playoffs. So yeah, it was tough for those kids, but hopefully they'll get another shot at it next year. We hope so. Um, you know, you mentioned before the, the cost of, of getting in, getting a kid involved in, in, in playing hockey. And, and uh, you know, as a parent myself, I can totally relate to that. It's, it's one of the most expensive sports out there yeah. to play. I mean, it, you know, a lot of the girls sport, I've, I've only got girls that, that I know when my daughter gets, you know, athletically involved, you know, things like cheerleading and things like that mm -hmm. have a lot of expense to them. But even that is nothing like hockey. Um, what do you say to the parent who, comes to you and says, I'm investing all this money. Why isn't my kid playing more? Oh. <laughs> well, it, it's hard. I mean, we try and be as fair as we can. I know I tell my parents up front, listen, it, it is travel hockey and it's competitive. I mean, no matter what level, but I, as a coach, I, I think there's ways as, I mean, all coaches, we can find ways to play kids. Now, listen, you know, your kid may not play the last three minutes of the game in a tight game. But there's games where we're winning by a lot where he'll get more ice time. So I try and tell my parents out of front, listen, it may not be fair on during this game, but we'll make it up to him somewhere else. Because um, ultimately, you're still trying to win hockey games. Um, right. And I know it's, you know, yes, it's, there's an expense and you travel and may not, maybe not see the ice a whole lot. But there are times where you're going to see it more. And 
we try and be as fair as we can with, with the parents and the kids when it comes to that. And we, and we tell them all up front, listen, this is what it is. But I know we've, we try and do a good job of that. And again, you know, there's a game where you're up by three or four goals. Well, then maybe that, that kid does play a little bit more. Uh, but when it's tight, maybe he doesn't. So it's just, it's part of sports. It's part of life as well. So. Right. It, I, it imagine that's, I imagine that's incredibly, uh, an incredibly tough conversation to have with these parents and probably something that they, a lot of them don't fully understand definitely going in. Well, again, it's up front, right? You got to talk to them at the start of the year. So they know now, even though you talk to them at the start of the year, they do forget. Um, Cause ultimately there's something about hockey. It's just, <laughs> it's the parents, there's just something about the sport where people get real, real competitive in the stands even. So, and I don't know what it is because, you know, I've been to my daughter's soccer games and what have you, and it's certain, it's not even close to this type, type of competitiveness. It's just, it's amazing, but it's just being, if you're open with the parents and communicate with them what the plan is or what's going to happen or how you see things, usually you don't have any problems. Usually. Now, how do we, uh, how do we continue to grow the travel program here? How do, how do we market that to, to attract kids from other areas and things like that to come here to play? And, you know, all of the, uh, the things, the successes that you see in, in other markets, how do we get Fresno up to that next level in your mind? Well, and we, we actually have, we do have kids that travel. I mean, we have some, some little ones from Los Banos that come twice a week. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's, it's a type of sport where it's just not easy to get involved, obviously. Um, it, you know, and obviously, I think the more, uh, the more success the monsters have, ultimately, the more success your youth program will have. You know, if, if, the, if the monsters are able to play at selling at, at, you know, consistently, I think that helps. There's just more people watching hockey. Um, it's tough without having, you know, you look at teams like, well, for example, San Jose. I mean, the Sharks have completely turned that city around. You know, even downtown San Jose compared to what it used to be. Uh, when kids have something to watch and parents have something to watch, it's really, I don't know how else you can get them interested in the sport. They're not watching something. So I think that's a, a big part of it is having uh, a presence, you know, at Salon Arena would be huge for, for the program, for all programs. I mean, even when, you know, like I said, when the Falcons were down there and you have, you know, 36 home games, a lot of home games. Now the Monsters may not play that many, but that's, you know, you know, you have two, three, 4,000 people there and kids want to see that. Or and when the kids see that, they want to do it. Exactly. You know, the, little, the little kids skating between periods and they, you know, they can do that. And, you know, we had, we had, we did have, a, you know, the monster games this year when we had people down there and we, you know, gave up the brochures and let them know, Hey, try hockey for free. We did have kids come to the rink because of that program. So um, it, it's just a matter of, again, exposure. And it's not, you know, hockey's not the sport typically at the top of mind, you know, so your baseball, your football, a lot of your, your real good athletes at the high school level, that's what they're playing. It doesn't mean our athletes aren't good, but a lot of the, the higher quality athletes are playing baseball, football, soccer, even soccer. Um, but again, I think as the, as the monsters go, whether it's a pro or a junior hockey team, whatever that's, I think that's how your youth program goes. I don't know how else we could, I don't know if the youth program survives without a larger program. Right. Yeah. You know, I don't know what they would be, you know, let, other than watching it on TV. And I don't even, I don't know how, I'm not sure how, my, how much, how many kids watch TV anymore anyways, <laughs> play, play video games. So I'm not sure they're watching hockey on TV either. So very good point. Um, so as we're recording this, we, you know, just saw the, uh, the shelter in place order get extended in Fresno out for basically another month. Um, what do you think the impact of something like the current shutdown is on the kids you coach in terms of their, you know, interest in the game, being able to stay, uh, you know, in game shape and, and, and keep their skills uh, growing and improving? What's this doing to these kids? Well, you know, I mean, all sports, right? Really, I mean, there's not much you can do. I know, I mean, I've had a couple of parents reach out and they're showing, they're showing pictures of their kids shooting pucks out in the backyard and what have you which is great. Um, but again, you know, I don't know without, well, one thing, it, it may be a break that some of the kids may be needed, maybe come back re-energized. I'm not sure. Um, hopefully we can get back out there in a month or so, but it's hard. There's nothing that compares to really skating as far as keeping in. You, know, you can, you can run and jog and bike ride and do whatever you want, but one, the ice is just a completely different animal. 
And uh, so hopefully kids come back energized and excited, which I think they will. Um, you know, we're going to try and the club's going to try and put some stuff out here this, this week um, as far as, you know, what are we doing to stay in shape and keep focused and whatever it might be. So hopefully they're, you know, they're chomping at the bit to get back at it. Well, we certainly hope so, and we hope that uh, the kids are back out there on the ice very soon. Um, we are going to take a quick break, and we will be back in just a minute with more with Jeff Ferguson here on Monster Vision. Goals. Assists. Save percentage. Statistics are the most accurate way to judge the success of a hockey player and a league. And welcome back to Monster Vision. We're here with Jeff Ferguson. Uh, Jeff, let's talk a little bit about your, your Fresno roots. You first came here back in around 94 and you, you were really one of the guys who ushered in the the WCHL era of the Falcons talk a little bit about coming to Fresno how that came about and and your early impressions of uh of the city and playing here yeah I, I was real fortunate I never never thought I'd be here this long obviously um we uh John Oliver I had a friend of mine who I played against, didn't play against him. He coached when I was in the Western League. John was a coach in Tri-Cities. I was in, in Spokane at the time. So I knew John, and, uh, and a friend of mine was, was working with him down here and starting this, develop this league. And I got a call um, over the summer saying, would you, like to, you know, would you like to play in Fresno? And I wasn't playing. I wasn't signed anywhere. I wasn't going to play. I was actually coaching. Um, I was getting set to coach. Uh, uh, a triple A team in Calgary at, at the midget level. Um, and I started skating with the national team a little bit uh, that summer as well with no intentions of really playing. They, they needed a goalie. So I was there for a few weeks and then came down here and, and John was listening. We're trying to develop a league here, um, you know, a West coast league. And I said, well, you know, I'll come down for a year and, and we'll give it a run. And then, you know, 25 years later, I'm talking to you <laughs> here on the patio, but um, yeah, no, I, I had no idea what to expect. Um, I mean, really, it was more of a, you know, maybe a, a winter or two in California. And, uh, but I've, I mean, the fans were great. The building was great to play in and, you know, fell in love with the place, as a lot of guys have. There's a lot of guys that stay, stuck and, and stayed here in Fresno after they played. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I mean, you know, we've, we've played other places and I've played other places, but there's always something nice about coming back to Fresno going down 99 and coming back where it was a little quieter and and uh you know still has there's a big city it's a big city but not you know you pretty well can get around easy enough and and uh it seems like anywhere you go you bump into someone you know so it's that's nice too but but i i thoroughly enjoyed it and again you know playing downtown was great and, and the fans were great and we had some pretty good teams and that always made it enjoyable as well and some good guys as well to play with there so yeah quite the experience now you were in RHI at the time too, right? Somewhere around there, you started up. Yeah, we were real. I got a t-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a relic. Um, well, we were we we're guys at my my age, my era. We were real lucky because you know we were playing in the minors, and you know you got paid. It mm -hmm. wasn't you didn't have to have it. You know, if during the during the winter you were paid. You didn't really have to worry about much, and and. Uh, but in the summers, you know, usually I would teach hockey schools. I'd go back to Calgary. I ran a couple of schools here or I, I teach the Sharks hockey school. Um, but this RHA came along, RHI, and it was great for, for, for guys playing in the minors. It was another, another summer, summer gig. And, you know, we made pretty good money, played in good cities. Uh, I played two years in Calgary, two years in Los Angeles, and one year in San Jose. Um, and it was just, it was, you know, a lot of fun. We played in AHL cities. Uh, I mean, our owner was Jeannie Buss in L.A., you know, mm -hmm. the Lakers. So that was, you know, we played out of the forum and, and you know, we're treated like, you know, top-notch athletes down there. Same in San Jose. They did a great job. We, you know, played in played at the Shark Tank. And, they, they uh, you know, we lived in great places. In, in L.A., we lived in Marina del Rey, you know, pretty hard to beat. Uh, and then, and like I said, and it was all 
all NHL cities, NHL rinks. So we, you know, play across North America and in Canada. And, and uh, it was a great, great summer job. You know, it was hard to beat. Yeah. And, and for, for those who don't remember, I mean, a 90s kid like me, I mean, roller hockey was everything. That was a big part of my introduction to the game. RHI was Roller Hockey International. Uh, and it, I mean, you guys were on ESPN too. You, there was all sorts of, of buzz around that league. It was so much fun. All the teams had great names, the New Jersey Rock and Rollers and, yeah. and you know, yeah. San Jose Rhinos and all of that. Uh, I think the Rhinos even played an exhibition game at, uh, at Selland uh, back around 95, 96. Uh, I, you know, yeah, I, don't, I think I was in LA then, but um, no, it was, it was a lot of fun. And it was a, it was, it was it was a pretty we had some pretty good players too that played in that league um uh, not even you I mean you guys you had guys in the american league that were playing in it mm-hmm. like, international league um so it was it was a lot of fun and it was you know short season quick season a sprint but uh it was hard to beat living in la and san jose and places like that and, and again getting a nice summer job which was which was huge uh, was that tough playing kind of year-round double duty like uh you know as opposed to you know what you might have been doing before i mean i know everybody stays in shape in the off season but that had to be kind of a different level well it was that we had about a month off between seasons and then about a month off at the end uh, maybe three weeks off um but it was great i mean um again to to, to go to the rink every day mm-hmm. even in the summer um and still you're working out and you're you're staying in playing shape it was it was great and it was a different sport too and being a goalie was even harder in that you couldn't really slide and mm-hmm. so you had to be you know a little smarter a little quicker uh but it was you know it, we were just so fortunate guys like i say guys around that era at my age that were playing in the minors at the time for that to be there i think it was there for about six years i think i think right around 2000 was the last year of rhi i believe but it was uh yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. For anybody in our audience who hasn't uh, ever seen RHI, just search it on YouTube. There's a there's a few games up there. It is a really uh, unique thing to watch if you've never seen it. Uh, definitely check that out. Um, what are your some of your favorite memories from your playing days here with the Falcons? You mentioned you played with a lot of great guys. Uh, what are what are some of the moments that that stick out to you? Well, I. I... There's a lot. I mean, I mean, I remember, I think our first, our first game at Selland, I think, I think it was our first game in the West Coast League and we had to fix the ice. The players were out there with pucks because the ice was, the ice was so bad. I think we played, I think it was San Diego and they were kind of looking like, what the heck is going on here? Uh, So that was like right off, right off the hop. And then, you know, it seemed like we had some just, I guess the best memories were probably playing in Selland. I mean, really, it was such a, especially when the building was, you know, we had a couple of sold out shows there. Um, I think the one, the one time, which was a highlight, I think we beat San Diego one nothing. And we had, I think we had nine or 10,000 people down at the rink. So that was a pretty big highlight. Um, you know, we fell short a couple of times in playoffs. Finally, I mean, the, you know, the Falcons, uh, you know, uh, took, took home the championship share, I think maybe in 2002, 2002, 2003. I'm not sure. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we, we always were competitive, which was great. Um, we, you know, one thing about, about the guys we had here, uh, you know, we left all out there. I mean, we played, we played hard with, played, played with passion and, and, uh, you know, tr- you know, tried to win as many games as we could not mail it in, you know, um, and try and give the people of Fresno what they want. It was a hardworking team and the guys that cared. So that was, I mean, that was big, but I mean, there's just so many, I mean, some, I'm not sure which memories, but there, like I say, playing at Sound Arena was great. It was a good old barn. Now the Falcons back then, and of course the Monsters now, both have very passionate fan bases. But you know they're they're different. It's a different generation. What are what are some of the differences you see uh, comparing back then to what you see now um, in terms of the hockey audience here in Fresno? Well, again, I just think it's a matter of of uh, well, the hockey's changed too. You know, I, don't, I mean, the games I've seen with the monsters, they don't seem to be quite as physical maybe as, as it used to be. I mean, you've watched both sides of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure. I think the fans enjoy the physicality of it. It doesn't have to necessarily be a fight all the time, but enjoy, you know, finishing your checks and things of that nature. But hockey's changed as a whole. 
it's not necessarily that the game's not played like that anymore. Maybe it's a little faster, a little more up tempo. Um, there's not quite as much body contact, and I'm not sure. Again, I'm not sure what the fans expect when they go to a Monsters game compared to what they used to go to games. So that part's different. But, but again, it's, it's just a matter of getting the fans down there. The games I've seen with the Monsters um, this year I mean some real good games, you know, uh, exciting games. It's just a matter of getting 4,000 people down there, you know. And how do we do that? I don't know, you know. Um, it probably takes a little bit of money, I'm guessing. A little bit of advertising and what have you. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's, that's something the ownership will have to figure out, <laughs> you know, whether it's because there's an expense. I mean, sure. You know, I mean, I know even when the Falcons at their, at their height, uh, you know, John, John tall, good guy worked hard, but also there's that comes at an expense um, when you're marketing a team. So, you know, you have to kind of sharpen your pencil and does it make sense to, to spend the money on marketing and advertising? Uh, you know, compared to getting, you know, how many, how many bodies do you need in the seats to make sense? So exactly. if, if people go and, and, the, and the team's exciting and the team, you know, uh, plays a hard brand of hockey, once they get to the rink, they'll love it. Uh, it's a matter of getting them to the rink. They just need that, that first, uh, that first. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. in the years since your playing days, you've of course taken that, all important step into into coaching and, and developing young players um, and you know here at Monster Vision we've, we've focused a lot on that we can't stress enough the importance of the role of coaching um, in developing young men and women you know what made you decide to start working with kids what what was that uh, what was that step like for you well it's something I've always done I've always been I, I started teaching hockey schools when I was um, 15 wow. back in Calgary and I've taught all across Western Canada uh, schools, and, and not just goaltending, but you know, skating, power skating, the whole the whole gamut. Um, my first my first hockey school in Calgary had actually one of my my backup goalie was one of my students, so it was a little embarrassing. But I show up in the rink, and there's a guy I played with the year before, and I was his instructor. Uh, but so it was a little odd. But I mean, I've always coached and always been teaching hockey schools and what have you, and I and I've played for some for some good coaches. So I've learned a lot through the years. And, you know, it's, for me, it's always about, I mean, it's skating, 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 and learning the proper way. Um, you know, if we can get them at an early age, understanding the, the proper way to skate, the proper balance, proper positioning, I mean, that's half the battle. And that's where it starts. And that's, I mean, I like, I like doing the learn to play and the little guys to get them off going in the right direction. Um, and not again, not just goalies, but but the whole thing. I mean, goalies have to have to know how to skate more than anybody, really, as far as balance and, and what have you. But again, it's doing it the right way at an early age. And if we can get them doing that uh, and po point them in the right direction, you know, they'll have success. There's no reason why kids out of Fresno can't be going to D1 college, can't be playing in, in the June in the Western Hockey League, can't be playing for the Fresno Monsters. There's no reason why they can't be doing that. Um, it's just a matter of you know, a little dedication, doing it the right way, getting the rank. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean you, you know, you have to go away to get that. Uh, like I said, there's plenty of kids that played right here in Fresno that are born in Fresno that have gone on to do great things uh, when it comes to hockey without having to leave. So, again, if we can teach them the right way, you know, there's, listen, discipline involved, parents have to be on board, and maybe you have to do a little extra. You have to go to a public session once in a while and do different things. You know, because we're on, on the ice, you know, twice a week and maybe you get down there, you know, maybe one extra time a week and get on the ice, work on your edges, work on your balance, work on your agility and go from there. Well, we appreciate your dedication and all of your hard work. Um, tell us uh, to close. Tell us how how kids can uh, get started here in Fresno. Where do they go? Who do they call? Uh, what's the next step to start playing hockey? You know what? The best thing to do is to go to the website, FresnoYouthHockey.com. I hope that's right. I should know that, shouldn't I? We'll, we'll fix it if it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that. Uh, but yeah, go to the website, and, and actually, everything you need is right there. You can click on. For, on there, we have our four-week sessions where you click on, you register for, uh, for free. We'll get your information. 
All the updates about the programs are on there. The phone number's on there. Obviously, if you call, I'll end up calling you back. Um, and then, I mean, that's the best place to go. And hopefully, you know, in 30 days here, we're back on the ice. I hope. Um, I'm not sure how much longer we could take this. Um, I know those kids are probably, you know, the parents are probably itching to get them to the rink too. Give them an hour, give them an hour off. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So well, hopefully, hopefully we get back out there again. We, our spring program, we have our spring program that has been delayed. Um, our trials this year are going to be in June for the travel program. Uh, but we're not sure now where that's going to be as far as, you know, if we're going to be able to get those, I think it's the middle of June was, we're going to be our tryout dates. So hopefully we get back out there in a month. We certainly hope so. And Jeff, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today. Can we have you back on the show during, uh, once we get started back up during travel hockey season to kind of give yeah. us an update on how things are going? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, thanks for having me and thanks for all the good work you guys are doing. Well, thank you. And uh, we thank uh, the audience as well for uh, joining us. We will be back with more Monster Vision in just a minute. Welcome to Logan's Roadhouse, the real American roadhouse. With a fire for great food, cold beers, loud music, and family and friends. So while those other guys turn the dial on a cooktop, we're turning up the fire in our souls, our stores, and in our customers' bellies. Because this is Logan's, where block party meets backyard barbecue, where letting go and cutting loose are always on the menu, and where we keep the fire raging by staying accountable for our food, service, and results, by striving to get better always, by embracing change. That means leading, not following, and doing it all with a passion to serve, with integrity in everything we do, and respect for everyone. That's how we keep the lights on, the guests happy, and the fire hot. Because everyone has an inner roadhouse spirit, and it's our job to stoke it. Logan's Roadhouse, where the fire lives. And welcome back to Monster Vision. Uh, John English here with Kala Mullaney and Brian Rivera, back for the Monsters Roundtable. Uh, guys, how are you guys doing uh, today? Uh, Kala... Are, are you trying out for uh, for a new Vegas show or? Uh... Uh, I'm just channeling my inner Polynesia, uh, homesick. So I got to keep it as much Hawaiian as possible, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to follow that up, but how are you this week? I'm doing all right. Yeah. Kind of hoping here. We're, looks like we're going to, well, we just got told another month of, quarantine but hopefully slowly here we start getting back to normal indeed the uh the shelter in place order being extended out to the end of may as we're uh that's relatively new news as we are recording this uh we had a chance to talk to jeff ferguson uh this week uh guys what did you think of what uh what he had to say uh, you know always a a great guy to to talk to and and so engaging and enthusiastic about hockey in fresno I thought you did a great job. He, uh, you know, was pretty straightforward with what the facts are. And unfortunately, it's it's a rough pill to swallow, you know, as far as numbers and what we have to do to get uh, kids involved. But I guess if um, he didn't do it, he wouldn't love doing it. Yeah, exactly. I think the big thing about keeping the numbers uh, uh, here in Fresno is, is basically retention. Um, we, in order to, to grow, we have to maintain the retention. Uh, we tend to lose a lot more kids once they start hitting the Bantam age, right after Bantams. Uh, they want to move on to, if they think Bakersfield or Stockdale will, will fill the, like an, a, an A team, whereas if we were all just to stick together, we ourselves can build an A team, and we've done it before. We uh, what, what, are we, what are we missing here exactly as far as, uh, you know, what, what are the steps that, that, that – our youth programs need to take in order to, to keep those kids? That's the million dollar question. Uh, it just, I don't really know. I've been involved with the youth hockey for about five or six years now, uh, my, since my son started playing. And it is, it's hard to do. Uh, they think that the grass is greener. Uh, some end up returning back, some stay there. Uh, it just, 
I, you know, to be honest, I don't know if I had that answer. We'd be having, you know, a full team every year. I just, it's, it's, it's something rough to do for sure. Yeah. I just think a lot of people get stuck on thinking that they have to play at a certain level or in a certain place to get noticed. And I don't know about you guys, but I've been watching uh, this Bulls documentary over the last year. Mm-hmm. And it's been quite, I picked up a few um, little nuggets about like where Dennis Rodman played and where Scottie Pippen played. And these guys that have played in Division Two schools and Division One, whatever, like schools I've never even heard of. And they've made it to the NBA. So I think these people have this uh, false perception that uh, they have to play in a certain place. Because we have just the same quality of coaches, if not better, because of our pro past players being still involved um, to give the kids what they need. Yeah, I mean, we have Simchuk, who was an NHLer. We've had, uh, you know, uh, Jay Johnson, who's played at, at, at those levels. You know, and yet we still – we still can't keep the kids past the, the Bantam years and into high school. That's, and that's, I think the other thing too, is that we don't have the high school type level San Jose does, whereas they have a, you know, a much bigger following in San Jose for their high schools compared to here, which I think what we need to probably end up doing is getting into the high schools themselves and, and starting that league. You know, that's the alternative to football. If your kid can't play football for whatever reason, have them come out and try hockey. It's the same season. You know, you're indoors, you don't have to really worry about the weather. You know, try that. But that's where we have to start. We have to start at the young kids and keep them here. Retention equals uh, equals numbers. Well, and, and, too, I think, you know, one of the things he brought up was the, the Learn to Play program. And, and I think that's going to, you know, we're not going to see the immediate results of that for a number of years. But I, I think that is something – that is going to have an impact in terms of the long game here, as far as, you know, you're introducing kids to the sport without that, you know, necessity of so much of an investment on the front end from the parents. I mean, they can give it a try for a little bit and, and, you know, with the equipment being provided and things like that, um, you know, kids getting a chance to learn the game without parents having to spend hundreds of dollars, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a hockey guy, and, and if my, you know, if I had a son that was of an age that thought, man, eh, maybe I want to play hockey, here, here, here's a basketball. That's like, you know, Very true. Yeah. thousands I mean, of it, dollars less up front to, uh, to, to, you know, get your foot in the door in, in terms of playing the game. And I, I think that investment with, with kids, you know, and, and introducing them to the game without it being such a hardship on the front end is going to pay off in the long run. It's just, you know, right now we're not going to see that yet. Sure. And yeah. the Monsters are doing – the youth program is doing a great job where they have uh, equipment to loan. So if you start off and you, and you start getting into it, you can – you know, you start off with this pair of skates. That's the must. Uh, you know, some pads, helmet, gloves. Then you can also, if, you know, once you start getting into it more, uh, into the in-house levels, you can borrow. Their, they got a whole C train out in the back, with just loaded with equipment from ranges from all kinds of sizes, and they're used, but it's something less that you have to pay for. Uh, they loan it out to you, and then as you, you know, you get into the sport more, you, you buy and you, you know, and you give back, and that's and that's what you do. And, and you got families who have started that. I started that with with my son. And as we bought gear, we returned gear back into, into the club. And we just, you know, we pay it backwards, I guess is how you would say it. Uh, so that other kids who are coming up in, into the sport, they have something to use. And it's less of a, you know, strain on the wallet for the parents. Sure, yeah, yeah. you know, you, you look at the equipment, you know, uh, I'm not going to be to the horn here, you know, but my brother owns the, the shop inside the ice rink and, we, we've talked many a times about trying to provide quality equipment at a reasonable price. And I think when people start coming into the shop and think, well, I got to buy this gear, you know, uh, it's not relatively inexpensive, but it's not real expensive either. You know, we're talking anywhere from the 20 to $50 range, but when you got to buy, you know, six, let's say different sets of $50, mm-hmm that, you know, they think it's that big cost. They go, well, what if he doesn't like it? Right. You know, so I think if parents kind of a little bit 
toned down and maybe just purchased the important parts, like something to protect their joints from when they're falling to make that maybe a little bit more enjoyable for the kids, that might help as well. I don't know. Some people go out there, you know, I've, I've worked in that program with Jeff, and some people go out there willy-nilly, you know, T-shirt and jeans and not even really have a sweatshirt on. And the kids love it, you know, but at the same time, I think they'd have a better enjoyment for them if they were well protected or, you know, a little bit better suited for, for what the actual environment is. Right. It's all up to the parents to do their homework a little bit on things too, as far as, uh, as far as, you know, preparing your kid for, for what to expect. I thought he had a, a, a really good perspective on, on how he's dealing with, uh, you know, a, educating parents a little bit too, as far as, uh, you know, preparing them for what to expect when your kid is playing or, or, or when your kid is not playing. Um, all of that is so important. And, and I think, uh, you know, we overlook the importance of coaching sometimes, but, uh, but that's one of the most, you know, key parts uh, to the equation. And, and uh, you know, having guys like Jeff um, in the program, it, it's, it's just a further testament to, to the job that, that that program is doing in, in terms of having good guys running, uh, running the show here. Yeah, for sure. The the hardest part about coaching uh, is not necessarily the kid; it's the parents. Uh, they, you know, for some reason they think that their kid is going to make the NHL every year, mm -hmm. and that's just not even close to what's going to happen. Uh, you know, your your kid's playing the sport; it, it's a it's a team sport. Plain and simple, you can't have just one kid do this. You have to have all five players clicking and you know, there are some kids that are, you know, above and beyond better than the other kids, but they can't do it all, all on their own. You still have to have a goalie that stops the, the, the shots. You still have to have the forwards take the pucks up the defense to help out. The problem is, is the parents themselves, they, they're geared so much on their kid. And it's so hard to tell them, Hey, your kid may not be playing this game. It's going to be, you know, he, you know, he's a good kid. He plays well, uh, but he's just not as strong as, these other players and you know that's the hardest part of going up to a parent 95 percent of the time parents get it you know they're out there for the kids are having a great time so let so be it if they get to play a shift a game they're good some parents aren't they're sitting there with their stopwatches up in the stand complaining about how much ice time their kid has and those that's hard because that transitions down into the kid after a while because then he starts getting frustrated because his parents are getting frustrated and that and that's that's the hard hurdle to, to, to jump over 100%. That's the biggest thing is the expectation, you know, has to be set from the beginning. Like Jeff said is, you know, we're, yes, ideally everybody's going to try to get the same amount of ice time, but it's not going to be every single game you're going to have equal amounts. And it's going to be close, you know, but I think as the overall season, everybody gets about the same amount of ice time. You may get more for some of the better kids at the beginning, you know, when the games are on the line, because Obviously, everybody wants to win, you know, and so then maybe when you're blowing out a team, the weaker kids play a little bit more than the stronger kids, you know, to give them their ice time back that they didn't get in the game prior or, or so be it, you know, and I think that's, even as an athlete, that's that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, right. you know, it, it happens at every level. It happened to me at juniors. I started out. Not playing. I played every, everywhere I went. I was first line, second line, and then in my last year of playing, I moved to New York, and I didn't play for the first half of the season. And I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I was going crazy, you know. But finally, it just it clicked, and everything was set going forward. But yeah, it, it's it's a hard pill to swallow at any age and any level for a player if they're, if they're not hitting the ice. Well, and I think we're uh, we're incredibly lucky to have uh, guys like Jeff Ferguson who you know come to town uh, as a player and then and then hang around for you know coming up on probably about thirty years now for him uh, being here in Fresno and being a uh, being a pillar of of that program. So it's uh, we're we're lucky to have him. I uh, want to shift gears real quick. Uh, we did get the news this week; uh, they made it official that the Ogden Mustangs are also 
among the WSHL teams moving over to the USPHL. You guys have any thoughts on that? I mean, they were really, really good uh, this past season and, and, and perennially, uh, uh, you know, a very solid program there. Um, I'm a little concerned if, uh, if they lump all of these WSHL teams into a, into a conference together, I'm a little concerned about, uh, you know, how some of these teams are, are going to impact uh, the monsters ability to succeed. Uh, what do you guys think? I kind of like it. Uh, the reason being, it kind of brings a sense of legitimacy to what we're bringing into the USPHL. Uh, you know, we, we want to have a good bunch of teams coming in uh, to show that, Hey, you know, we're, we're a legit bunch of uh, teams coming into this new league. So I like it. And in the, you know, and then, it's going to make us, the Monsters, have to really think off the off season. you know, who are kind of players we want to have so that we can compete with Ogden and, and those teams such as, you know, like Colorado. That, I mean, that'd be the, the way to go, I think. I think that, that should work in our advantage. Well, absolutely. It's like when the Monsters first joined the Western States League, you know, and Idaho joined the league, and they were brought um, – they brought a very competitive team in with, the, you know, the same time the Monsters did. And, you know, it, it was a good, a good rivalry to have, you know, one year the Monsters would go play up there, you know, the next year the, uh, I, the Steelheads would come this way, you know, it was just, it was a good deal. And uh, I, I think the, the better teams we can get, Ogden's a, a great organization and it's going to be something, you know, that us Monster people are going to have to, uh, raise 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 our game up uh you know to, to stay at their level because obviously they've been one of the best in the league for the, the last few years and um, i think we can get up there we just need to you know bear down and get it get it done definitely forces uh our guys to uh you know increase their increase the the ability to bring in uh those talented players and uh you know up their scouting and everything else uh it, it's tough. And, and I mean, from the looks of it, they probably won't all be, uh, you know, having to play one another, you know, every three weeks or whatever. They won't all be in the same uh, division. Um, I imagine that Ogden will be in there with, uh, you know, some of the teams that uh, the non-California teams uh, that are coming over and that uh, the Monsters will mostly be seeing uh, San Diego and, and, and those types of teams uh, again, for the most part. Uh, I imagine by the time this is all over with, they'll have enough for enough teams coming over for two separate divisions, uh, and we won't see much of Ogden, uh, similar to how the WSHL had things set up. But we will have to see. Ogden uh, only had four losses all year last year, finished the uh, season on a 19-game winning streak. So uh, they are tough competition if the Monsters have to face them too much. Exactly. That's yep, exactly sure. it. They're uh, they're one of the premier teams in their in the you know WSHL. And I can't imagine them making a jump and then not being the same exact organization. So you know we're going to have our work cut out for us. Indeed, and we'll keep an eye on the uh, developments in the weeks to come, guys. Any final thoughts on anything this week? How's everybody doing? Everybody healthy? We're all healthy. healthy. Yeah, All right, no one... guys. No one's uh, withering away over here, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're all putting on a couple extra layers of... Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no exercise going whatnot. on. All right. Well, uh, we will catch up with you guys down the road a little bit. We'll have more great content coming to you in the weeks to come. Thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Monster Vision. Everybody stay safe out there. We will see you very soon.